Welcome back. Uh, week five of our class uh, and our topic today is suffering. A difficult topic, uh, one that uh, is important for each one of us and particularly uh, in our uh, professional lives. So uh, what can we say? Um, I like the approach that there are sort of three ways we think about suffering or ought to be thinking about suffering and uh, uh, that's uh, listed here in, in point one, and I hope you're, uh, you've got the outline, you're following along. Uh, the complexity of our thinking about suffering, I think that there's the first level is the, the broad cultural and philosophical approaches. How, how are we supposed to suffer? What do, how are we told uh, uh, to relate to suffering? And, uh, and I think it's good to be aware of that because we do come from different cultures, different families, different religions, and, uh, and so uh, to be aware of those differences. Secondly, though, the question of what suffering really entails uh, is, a, is an issue. How do we define it? Suffering is notoriously difficult to define, but we know it when we see it. <laughs> um, so what can we say about some of those things? And then thirdly, uh, and most uh, specific to our time together, uh, is there a particular Christian approach to suffering? Uh, and if so, what, what would that be? So let's look uh, then, uh, point number two, a complex variety of frameworks uh, in facing suffering. Uh, we come uh, with different ways to, to think about it. There's a level of family or commun <coughs> communal ways of handling it. And um, you know, uh, as I was thinking about this, I just remembered a, a childhood uh, uh, event and a sort of thing we did. Uh, we lived on the East Coast near the shore uh, and we'd swim in the summertime, uh, and we'd get uh, they have jellyfish things. They're not the big uh, man of war, life threatening things, but uh, it would really hurt uh, to get a little jellyfish sting, and the kids would come running out of the sea yelling, and I'm sure I did that at one point. And uh, our family had a, a cure for that. Uh, the, the, re the relief from the jellyfish uh, sting was to drive into town to the ice cream parlor and get an ice cream cone. And by the time I finished that ice cream cone, it no longer was stinging. And that was the way suffering was dealt with. That's how we dealt with the crying child on the beach. Uh, you can assess uh, that success and what that meant. But also in that context, sometimes in our families uh, or communities, uh, other kinds of ideas come up. Like for instance, a big one is uh, uh, real men don't cry. Uh, and so uh, men are encouraged not to connect with their suffering in that context. Uh, and uh, um, maybe the result is that women are the ones who are supposed to carry the burden of suffering. And I don't think either that can be all that healthy. But that's another pattern uh, we have and people and we find that as we connect with, with, with people in real situations, they're struggling with those, uh, those elements. <clears throat> another one I think of comes up a lot is the idea of uh, competition and suffering. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, uh, you know, uh, I'm suffering, uh, you know, I'm, I've got the problem this week, so don't hassle the parents with your problem because, you know, or, or my life situation is worse than yours, so uh, uh, your suffering is less important than mine. Uh, those are issues that are problematic in our suffering, but in a sense, they're the most natural kinds of approaches because they come out of real, situations in which we are either denying suffering or making it too important, or uh, in any case, we're not dealing with it very well. I think of Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, quotation of an earlier uh, statement by a, a, a pastor, that the moral arc of the universe is long, but that it bends toward justice. That's an optimistic statement. Uh, not everyone would agree that it does bend toward justice. There are many people who would say that they uh, experience injustice and don't expect anything else. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's a good thing to hope for. It's a good thing to have uh, policies in place that move in that direction. Uh, I think of slavery as something that uh, unfortunately was enshrined in our Constitution, but that the Constitution also had uh, processes in it that allowed it to be challenged and uh, uh, and ultimately to, to be eliminated. But we are still dealing with the, with the injustices and the sufferings uh, 
that result from that kind of awkwardness in dealing with, uh, with situations on that national level. Uh, approaches characteristic of the various major cultures. There's that too, and a couple of things I want to say here. One is, uh, I think in North America, our culture, uh, I, I'm not the only one to say this, but I think it tends to be materialistic. And uh, if you have a materialistic at attitude, then there's not a lot of place for suffering. So if you think that, you know, if you can get the right kind of home, get the right kind of car, get the right kind of toys, and have the right kind of vacations, uh, the result is uh, that that will eliminate suffering. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. And it may make other kinds of suffering worse because we're not attending to the things that cause uh, suffering in a, in a deeper sense. So the materialism of our culture I think, doesn't help with, uh, with people uh, coming into suffering and wondering what to do about that. Uh, some of the religions have particular approaches to suffering. Um, Buddhism, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to say every Buddhist feels this way and relates this way to suffering, but generally speaking, you know, it's a strong component of, of, uh, of Buddhism, that Buddha uh, came to his enlightenment as a result of the deep suffering that he was feeling, and he decided uh, to look for a way in which that could be eliminated. And uh, he saw suffering as the result of personal attachments to the world around him. And so uh, in Buddhism then, the move of the spiritual direction is to release from spiritual, from uh, attachments of various kinds and to find oneself detached from the world and therefore able to function within it and to, to help other people without feeling attached. Uh, so that's a, a way to, uh, approach it. It's, it's to just uh, do everything you can that even if you are in pain, you're not suffering. Um, notice the difference there to what we said about Christianity understanding the human being as fully needful, as blessedly needful, that, that our knowledge and our love comes from the fact that we have connections and we need them and we, we pursue them. So it's a little bit different. That's a different approach is what I'm saying. Islam is another uh, way uh, in which suffering is, uh, is perceived. Uh, and I mean, I don't know about you, but we run into Muslims these days. Not every Muslim is going to see it exactly this way, but in general, the religion understands God to be uh, high and lifted up uh, and somewhat inscrutable, so that uh, the sufferings that we feel, we must simply accept as the will of God. It's not, uh, it's, it's a learning about God's uh, omnipotence, uh, but also a, uh, a recognition that suffering simply exists. And that's also a little bit different way of understanding uh, <clears throat> suffering from, from what we will talk about in terms of a, of a Christian point of view. But it's good to understand, right? The, I mean, the different approaches that we might find. Let me say this about Christianity, though, that I think in its popular form, there's a tendency in Christianity to look for the escapism uh, from suffering. Uh, maybe prayer can mean I can get out of suffering, or um, uh, praying against something means that it's no longer a part of my life. Um, maybe I can pray for a better home, a better car, and therefore get into a better situation. Uh, there's a, uh, there are churches with a philosophy that uh, of uh, of the fact that unless I am prospering financially, uh, God is, uh, I'm, I'm probably not right with God. And so uh, I'm not sure that those have deep uh, roots in, um, in suffering. I'm not sure that particular Christianity is exportable outside the United States where there are Christians who live and move in suffering uh, constantly. But uh, these are all ways in which uh, we are looking at, the, at, at how we are told how we are encouraged or how we might be encouraged to, to, uh, to look at suffering. Um, and I think it's helpful to look at some of those. Let me suggest also uh, to sort of expand this. Uh, I've uh, listed a book at the end of the, uh, of the outline, Timothy Keller's Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. And, uh, and he uh, 
he looks at a lot of the issues there in, in, a, in a very uh, intelligent and uh, uh, helpful way. And I think that if you're interested in, in expanding some of these things, uh, um, you can take a look at what he says. The last point I'll, I'll raise in terms of the sort of frameworks uh, that we have in terms of suffering um, is this one. Uh, this comes up occasionally as well. Does the reality of suffering negate the possibility of God's existence? Or to put it more specifically, if God is a God who is both all-powerful and loving, why am I going through what I'm going through now? Uh, he either doesn't really love me, or he loves me a lot, but he doesn't, he doesn't have the power to control my life. But if those things were true, none of us would suffer. So well, what is that about? Uh, that's a primary, it's a prime philosophical, theological question, and to, to deal with it fully would take a, a different kind of context, a whole different lecture. But I want to mention it because it does come up. And uh, I think that a simple answer, or an answer that makes sense to me on that, is that uh, God is all-powerful and God is loving, and he shows it by coming to us in Jesus Christ coming to us in the Holy Spirit, coming to us in other Christians with solutions. Uh, so he actually uh, has sort of bent over backwards in order to enter into the problem of human suffering and, um, and to address it. Uh, he's not just blasting everything away uh, the way we might uh, <clears throat> see in a, you know, uh, Avengers Endgame, uh, just destroy everything and then uh, start again but rather he's entered the situation into, uh, in, in order to improve it. And I think that's a way we can begin to understand uh, how God is all powerful and loving and dealing with, uh, with suffering as it exists. All right, point three. Uh, how might we conceive suffering? How might we define it? What are, what are the aspects of the elements of suffering that, uh, that are important to look at. Again, uh, Timothy Keller's book is, is a one source, uh, and I'm sure you'll find some other, a lot of sources about uh, uh, what, uh, what suffering entails. I'm going to just focus on three elements uh, that I think uh, relate to our context here. Suffering, first of all, is physical. There's such a thing as physical suffering, and sometimes it can be extremely uh, intense. How do you know someone's in pain? I think the uh, nursing answer is they say they're in pain. How do you know they need pain management? They say they need pain, pain management, and uh, you know, they're the experts at that point. Uh, suffering, uh, physical suffering is, uh, uh, puts us, can put us right at the end, at the edge of our humanity, and, uh, and can be uh, terrible. Uh, <clears throat> it's not the only form, though. Uh, and. Um, Sometimes it's so painful because it's paired with, uh, with psychological suffering. Uh, the implications of the extreme pain I'm in may mean that my life is over, my life is ending, life as I know it. Um, sometimes a mild pain can come uh, with, uh, with acute uh, psychological implications, and, uh, and, so, uh, and so it becomes a, a, a problem there. So to what extent do we we'd say suffering is physical? To what extent is it, uh, is it psychological? Um, yeah, the change of life that uh, can bring um, is, uh, can be profound. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, a situation uh, that I knew about because there's a student in my class a few years ago who was not turning in his assignments, and so uh, I connected with him. I said, let's have some coffee. And he opened uh, what was going on with him uh, as a high school student. He was um, really a, pr a promising athlete, and people were looking at him for, uh, uh, for a, 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 a future in, uh, uh, in, in major ath athletic teams. Uh, and he was in, a, I think, a car accident or something, uh, with the result that uh, he got a tear in his uh, core muscles, and they were infected with the result that his core muscles were just uh, totally uh, no longer useful. He could uh, strengthen them for a daily activity, but there was no way that he could understand uh, a future in, in athletics. 
This was a year and a half, two years later, and he still hadn't accepted, uh, he hadn't understood the, the fullness of what was happening. So he was floundering, uh, he was losing sleep, uh, and the, the pain was gone, uh, but uh, psychologically uh, he didn't understand what life could be, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, he was in bad shape, suffering then uh, as psychological uh, alongside that reality. Um, Suffering also, I'm going to suggest, is spiritual. And here again is the question of how we understand spirituality or we, uh, we address it. But I'm going to say that uh, if that suffering is spiritual, if it means that we're running into the conclusion that life itself is meaningless, that life itself has no purpose, uh, that the deepest wellsprings of life aren't there. God is not there. A reality uh, is falling through for me and there were the result of a complete loss of hope. That also is uh, a very uncomfortable place to be in and an aspect of, uh, of human suffering that also needs to be understood and addressed. So uh, those three forms, and there's much more to say about it, I would think, um, but at least it suggests some of the uh, parameters, some of the, the scope of what suffering may entail. And also it implies that as we encounter suffering people, we're also asking uh, what kind of suffering are they going through? What's the suffering diagnosis on this one? Let's look then at, uh, at suffering in the Christian tradition and uh, uh, ask what uh, is said there. Uh, is anything in particular, something different, uh, and, uh, and see what, uh, what we come up with. The Old and New Testament are both very honest about suffering, uh, very full of, uh, of suffering. Uh, if we look uh, be beginning with Genesis, which we often do, don't we, in these uh, lectures, uh, we talked about the creation of Adam and Eve and their fall. And then comes uh, in Genesis 3, uh, God delivers his judgment on their disobedience and he exiles them from the Garden of Eden. Uh, and listen to the language. I'm reading um, 3, 16 through 19. To the woman, God said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to the man, he said, because of you, you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. You are dust and to dust you shall return. So the judgment of God. And in it we see... Uh, the increase of suffering both in the man and the woman. We see the change of relationship in the man and the woman. Um, and all of these, I mean, we can look at it in two different ways. Is this simply the wrath of God punishing them? He's, you know, sort of a, a, an abstract kind of uh, coming down with a heavy hand. Uh, we can look at it that way. It can also, we can see it as the, um, uh, as, as sort of the consequences of disobedience that because they chose not to move in the direction in which God had set up life for their blessing, they took a different direction, and as a result, they're against, going against the grain, and things aren't working out. And you got thorns and thistles, and if that's not a metaphor for a lot of things, well, I don't know what it is. Uh, it's just life is, not, uh, is no longer uh, the way it's supposed to be, with the result that there is suffering. What does the Old Testament tell us that we do uh, about suffering? What are, what are God's statements about that? He, he pushes human beings out into a place of suffering, uh, but then he also uh, has ways to call us back. Uh, I'm going to mention two, and they're, they're sort of uh, large elements of the Old Testament understanding of, of, uh, of the return to God. 
Uh, one is, it arises in, in Israel's early history when it is connecting with the, the nations around it, uh, and it is wooed by the other religions, and, uh, and as a result, it becomes less obedient to God. Uh, and what God sees is that is lacking not only in love of God, but also lacking in love for each other. Uh, there are some things that come in there, and God warns them. He says, uh, change that. Uh, change your self-centeredness, um, or I will let you go into the nations. I will uh, push you out again from the promised land. And uh, uh, so his, his, his call to them is turn around, or uh, in, in another way, in another sense, repent. Repent, and, uh, and, and you will find blessedness again. So abandon your disobedience and you will find uh, no longer will you suffer. Uh, there's another way God speaks to the suffering of the nation, though, too, and this comes in in later years, the later centuries, when Israel not only is in connection with the world around it, but also then it suddenly becomes dominated by the larger forces and the, and the world powers that are beginning to arise in the Middle East. So Egypt suddenly has its agenda and is fighting with Babylon, and Israel's in the way. And so Israel is caught, not because of its own <clears throat> selfishness at this point, uh, but because of the selfishness of the whole human race in the world. And so it becomes a political uh, ball that's being tossed around. Uh, and here, uh, another answer comes. It's not, you know, uh, you're disobeying, so uh, straighten up and I'll sit, make the situation correct. God says, you are faithful, you are turning to me, you are uh, in relationship to me, so hang on, hang on with what you know is true, uh, and I will come. Um, Jesus' words uh, in Luke, uh, he says, uh, his language is, uh, look up, for your redemption is nigh. And so there are times when um, we need to change uh, what we're doing and, and, and come around. And maybe it's rela in relation to things that we are, uh, we are suffering. Things are not going right in our life. Are there things that we need to straighten up and get together? Or are there, is it a matter of hanging on because there's some, that situation is maturing beyond our power that uh, God is going to uh, bring it about? I mean, we could ask what the situation is with you today. <laughs> uh, the, the suffering that you're having in your life. Is it self-inflicted or is it inflicted by others? Uh, to what extent uh, are we called? Sort of discerning on a day-to-day -day basis is one way to, to look at this material. Uh, do we change some things uh, or is it really a matter of hanging on in the, in the, in the right ways that we are, we are going? So our fourth point is that the great example of suffering uh, in the Old Testament is Job. Uh, it's uh, quite a story. If you've never read the book of Job, uh, uh, you're welcome to it. Uh, it's long. It's really quite philosophical, but I'm going to give you the story in a nutshell. Uh, Job is a, a, a successful man, wealthy. He's got a lot of children. He's got flocks. He's got homes. Uh, and everything's working well. And he's a man who uh, is worshiping God as well. Uh, and he loses everything. And not only physically, uh, he loses his, his family, his flocks, uh, his wife is with him at the end. Uh, everything is destroyed, and he's ending, he ends up on a, on a, on a pile of cinders uh, covered with boils. So he's afflicted in every way. Uh, and the deepest affliction is the spiritual. He's asking, why God? Why has this happened? Uh, uh, I don't understand why this has happened. And then to comfort him, um, we have three friends that come by. These friends are so friendly, they're willing to, in fact, criticize him for, uh, for his strange question. Because they say if God is the God that he is, he's a good God and all-powerful, then the fact that Job has lost his fortune means that Job did something wrong. Uh, and there's something problematic in either Job's actions or his attitude. And they argue this all the way around. They keep going around in circles, and, uh, and, and Job refuses to accept uh, that this is true. Constantly he'll say, you know, it's, it's just not right. I, I wish God would uh, speak, come down and talk to me and, and tell me uh, 
what's going on because uh, um, I just uh, I can't, can't understand why this is the case. So he rejects their friendship and <laughs> their arguments. Uh, and at the end, what happens is, is that God does speak. Suddenly God uh, speaks directly to Job and he essentially says, who are you to ask me to speak? I, I, you have no right to ask me to speak. You are a human being and I am God. But he does speak. He does offer to Job his relationship with him. He says, You're, you know, I am the God you serve. I am the God you love. And uh, uh, you should be happy with that. And, uh, and Job comes around. He begins to realize, in fact, that God has offered something better than strict justice or a return to his wealth. God has offered him himself in relationship. The fact that the story ends with, in fact, Job gets back all his treasures, uh, gets a new family, <laughs> uh, almost sounds, almost feels like an anticlimax. I mean, the answer is given by God. Uh, I have given you myself, and that's, uh, that's what you most could, could have, uh, most deeply need. And, um, and so uh, what would Job do with all that other stuff that he gets? But nevertheless, he's, uh, He's happy with it. So Job the sufferer, suffering uh, physically, psychologically, spiritually, uh, and, uh, and that question is what's debated there in the book of Job. The New Testament um, picks up those patterns, picks up the reality of suffering and the depth of suffering. Um, and it moves it forward. I think one of the places where uh, we see that it's precisely all of the suffering in the Old Testament is taken on board uh, is in one of the most difficult aspects of the Christmas story in Matthew, where um, part of the fact that Jesus is, is uh, told that he's being born in Bethlehem and Herod hears about it, Herod sends his soldiers then uh, to kill all male children below the age of, uh, of two uh, because he hears that this person is supposed to be a king and he hears it as a, comp as a competitor with him. And we, we read in Matthew 2, uh, 16 to 18, um, this account. Again, a part of the Christmas story. I don't often hear this preached at Christmas, okay? But here it is. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated and he sent and killed all children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken of by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. A, uh, a horrible thing happening in relation to Jesus' birth. Uh, and sometimes uh, I've, I've read the commentaries that say, uh, was it worthwhile for Jesus being born for all these uh, other children to be killed? Uh, I think that's not quite the point. I think the point is that Jesus is born in a world where th these things happen. Uh, it's a quotation from Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, the way it functions there is that uh, the, the weeping in Ramah and the weeping in the tribe of Rachel are because, uh, because of the deportation to Babylon, women are being separated from their children. In other words, because of the chaos of the nations, families are being torn apart and, uh, and, and, and that kind of horrible tragedy is, uh, is occurring. Uh, the message here in Matthew is that Jesus is born into that world, not into a uh, Disneyland of the happiest place on earth, but into a place where there is suffering and will always be suffering uh, unless, uh, unless something can be uh, accomplished or changed. So I'm gonna look at these three elements of human suffering that we've looked at above. Self-centeredness, 
uh, the, the chaos of nations, and then also the problem of the mystery of distance with God. Uh, and just point to the fact that Jesus uh, has something to say in each, in each context. Uh, <clears throat> in John chapter 8, uh, the verses 1 through 11, we have the story of the woman who's caught uh, in adultery. And uh, those who find her are interested not in justice, but they're they want to trick Jesus into saying she ought to be killed because he's such a nice guy going around saying he loves everybody and they're tired of it. Uh, and so this is the story. I'll read these uh, 11 verses. The scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had caught, been caught in adultery and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law of Moses, it's commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They said, to this, they said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, sin no more. So uh, Jesus enters into the problem and the suffering of, uh, of particular sin. The, the sin of the woman is something that he addresses and, uh, and relieves. Uh, there's another problem with, the, with sin here, and that is uh, the self-righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees that come and, and bring her. They're not interested in her situation. They're interested in, in, in calling him out in a certain way. So uh, there's that sin as well, uh, that they would use the woman to get something out of Jesus. Uh, but there's also commentators will point to the, the deeper problem with uh, have, her having been caught in an, in an act of adultery. It had to have been with a guy. And where was he? Why did they bring the woman and not bring the man? So these men who bring the, women, the woman look like they are, in fact, uh, ignoring uh, sinful attitudes that men can pick up and using the excuse then of the woman's adultery to, uh, to bring about their own agenda. And Jesus cuts through all of that by addressing the question of sin. If, the, if there's someone with, in, among you without sin, let them be the first self-righteous person to throw a stone. And he makes the point and uh, diffuses the situation. I mean, we see all through the Gospels uh, ways in which Jesus uh, touches the question of that personal self-centeredness and, uh, and, uh, and in, a, in an attempt to relieve it uh, and to, uh, to make it less a problem, ultimately, in his death on the cross. We also see Jesus as a, as a pawn in the chaos of nations. And I'm thinking of the... Uh, passage uh, in John 19, 33 to 38. Pilate entered the headquarters again and summoning Jesus, he asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate said, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate said, so you are a king. Jesus said, you say that I am a king. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said, what is the truth? And after he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. Jesus is shuttling around from the, uh, what Rome thinks of him, what uh, the Pharisees think of him, and um, 
and, uh, and in that, uh, in that very uh, anguished situation, he is retaining his own uh, sense of, of identity and dignity. But the third point, the problem of distance from God, the mystery, uh, is God with me? This also Jesus articulates uh, in a very poignant way. Uh, we find it in Mark chapter 15, the description of his crucifixion. And in the, his last moments of life there, uh, as he's dying, uh, he turns uh, in, in, the, in the sense of the, of, the, of, the, of the onset of death, he turns his face upward and he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He experiences uh, the, the intense spiritual uh, anguish of being separated from God. Uh, it's a hard point to understand in relation to Jesus. If we believe as we do that he's the son of God, how could he ever be uh, separated from God? But all we can say is something happened there so that none of the rest of us ever need to be separated from God. Uh, he, in, in that moment, he's able to quote Psalm 22, one, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So even in his destitution, he's actually faithful to the tradition. He finds something in tradition to express the depth of his desolation uh, and, uh, and encounters that. So, Jesus is someone, uh, he's the man of sorrows, as, as we sing in the hymn. He's the one who knows suffering. But what we understand with that, that somehow in that experience, in that tradition, uh, Jesus is able to alter the, uh, the parameters of suffering. Suddenly suffering becomes something that uh, is to some degree negotiable, is to some degree uh, valuable. And uh, it's, uh, it's something that is specifically Christian in its, uh, uh, in, in its grasp because it connects so closely with Jesus and what he did. Very hard to tell anyone who's suffering. Uh, you're, this is, isn't this great? This is a great opportunity for you to, <laughs> for something to happen. And yet, uh, in the deepest sense, uh, for a Christian, this can be true. Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. This is a, a letter Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and he wrote it out of anguish. This is, uh, it's his anguished letter is what we uh, hear, uh, the, uh, those who understand uh, Paul's life. Uh, he was upset with things that were happening there. He was under uh, persecution himself. And so speaking out of his anguish to their anguish, uh, he said this, I'll read these, these verses. This is again, chapter one, three to seven. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation, who consoles us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to console those who are in any affliction with the consolation which we ourselves are consoled by God. So right away you hear, there's suffering and there is consolation, and Paul is experiencing both. For just as the sufferings of Christ are abundant for us, so also our consolation is abundant through Christ. If we are being afflicted, it is for your consolation. If we are being consoled, it is for your consolation, which you experience when you patiently endure the same suffering that we are also suffering. Our hope for you is unshakable, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our consolation. So in this passage, Paul begins to show uh, the value of suffering if it is felt, if it is undertaken in, uh, in, in the right parameters. And that is with the consolation that is inherent comes our ability then to be someone who can uh, uh, comfort others in their suffering in some way, in some way. So uh, let me finish by uh, with these four points on how it is, uh, how from a Christian perspective, 
suffering can be understood as something in some sense positive uh, and, uh, and, and under what circumstances that is the case, all right? The first is a general comment. Um, to participate in suffering as Jesus did means also to participate in his resurrection. What do I mean by that? Jesus said to us, uh, I'm going to the cross, pick up your cross and follow me. It's very easy just to hear the negative side of that. Uh, you know, uh, your Christian life is gonna be miserable, but that's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> you know, uh, self-denial. Uh, what we don't hear is that if we're following Jesus to the cross, we are also following, following him to resurrection. So our self-denial, our willingness to set pleasures aside uh, for the sake of, uh, of, of, of the road that he leads us on means that we will find ourselves in a, new, in a new life. It's not just a better life. I mean, it's not just, it's, a, it's a promise if there's death, there's resurrection. Uh, if, there's, if there's a dying, then there is in fact a new life. So that's the opportunity. That's an amazing promise. It's an amazing offer uh, that as we follow Jesus in the kind of suffering that he uh, experienced, what we will find is new life. It means then um, the opportunity of suffering is, uh, is to grow, to grow in relation to our uh, understanding of ourself, of our world around us, and of other people. And I've uh, included here uh, the opportunity in suffering is to get a sense of my own self-centeredness and, and to what extent that that's running my life. Uh, to, uh, to, to get a sense of, uh, of, of world chaos and, and af be able to affirm, again, face the fact that I am encouraged to understand that God is in control. Right now, I think uh, this is something I, I feel every day uh, with the political uh, situation in our country at this point, the, the astonishing uh, divisions and, uh, and heated language. Uh, there is the chaos of the nation is real. Uh, and um, and it, it's something that I have to come back to again and again. Will I affirm that uh, Jesus is Lord? Will I affirm that God is in control uh, in the way that I hope he will take it through <laughs> and in the way that he will take it through? A chance to grow also in relation to the mystery of the presence and the absence of God as I feel it at some times. Uh, and, uh, and, and these are opportunities. I will say I shared with you... Uh, no, oh, I don't think I did. Um, the time of greatest uh, suffering for me, I think, was when um, th there was a period of time when we uh, looked like we would lose our home. I was out of a job uh, some time ago, uh, and it really, uh, really caused um, a lot of anxiety. I mean, tremendous anxiety. Uh, because my area is theology, <laughs> I couldn't get away from the fact that I should be taking things to the Lord all the time. I, I couldn't just die in a puddle of, uh, of anger. Uh, and I think the result was, uh, I know the result was that I was changed by it. I became a different person uh, in, in all of these ways. Uh, not that it was magic and not that it was you know, somehow you know, permanent. It's something that I have to work on constantly. But I know I'm someone who can say, and I, I suspect you are too, to suffer with Christ is, uh, is a life-changing experience and uh, one not to be missed. So the development then uh, that suffering can offer is primarily, as we saw in the language of Paul there, the development of sensitivity and compassion. And uh, as I am somehow allowing suffering to have an effect on me, a work on me in a broader way, then I am also specifically or generally more sensitive or more ready to hold and have uh, compassion to others. Um, but the key to this, and this is the last comment, first of all, never as escapism. Uh, Christianity can never be an escape uh, from suffering. Jesus does not allow that, and he, he never exampled that. Uh, rather, it's a, it's a plunging into the suffering that is real, but in an openness to God, 
in a readiness to speak with God, to hear what God has to say, to communicate with God. Tell you what, that also means to be in communication with others, whether friends or family or professionals that we need to get some good response from uh, so that people understand our suffering and can, uh, can address it as well. What this does then, and this ties back to some of the other uh, lectures that we've had, this is nothing more than affirming our needfulness as human beings uh, and the, the power and strength of relationship which comes out of that, which is necessary for us as humans. And that, I think, uh, is what I would say to begin to uh, prompt some thinking in you, in your own minds, about the place of suffering. <laughs>